Добрий вечір. В ефірі Ткаченко і у нас в гостях достатньо незвична людина – лама Оля Нідал. Вітаю в Україні. Дякую, дякую дуже. І де є ваші буддисті дреси? Я є лей буддист, я не монк. Це не вийшло мою конституцію, так що я вирішив це. Але ми дреси, як і всі інші. Це не спеціальний дрес код для, скажімо, нормальних життя в світі буддистів. We are talking about your mission. You uh, look at yourself as a missionary of Buddhism mm. or... A traveling professor. Missionaries are people who say, what you have is bad, you have to do what I have, right? And what you are doing? I don't say that. I say what you have is hopefully good for you, right? You know, and then this is what we work with and you see if you like it. Why Buddhism became so popular uh, in countries like Russia, in many European countries which have ages of Christianity tradition? Well, Christianity is excellent if you like somebody else to tell you what to do. But you also have some people, you know, who want to be independent and for them Buddhism is very good. You know, we trust our own, we trust, yeah, we trust our own mind. We understand that in essence it's like space. It means it cannot be destroyed, it cannot be harmed or hurt and then fear is gone. Then from the level of no fear, one can begin to enjoy all the amazing things happening, like all the cars behind you all the time, and the thing that's happening, your bright face, and all this, right? The next thing. Then everything becomes interesting because it happened. And then as the third step, we see all beings want happiness and want to avoid pain. And they are many, and I'm just one. So maybe it's more important. I do something for them. Mm -hmm. So fearlessness, spontaneous joy, and active compassion come naturally when we meditate. So you have no fear? No, not really. I have a hundred parachute jumps. I also jumped after my accident where mm -hmm. I nearly died and twelve last jumps till we left till we went to somewhere else. And then you know big motorcycles, BMWs, mm -hmm. fast curves and everything like that. I really like that. Good roads in Europe, right? No <laughs> surprises. <laughs> So, uh, in a way, you are speaking about Buddhism. It means that Buddhism is more philosophy than religion. It's not a religion. It's a religion. Religion means you try to get back to something perfect you, you lost, right? Mm -hmm. Religar, right, in, in, in Latin. But religion, Buddhism says we were always confused. Our mind was always like an eye that could look outside and see everything there, but couldn't see itself. Mm -hmm. And now... We have a mirror. Many people uh, in Ukraine and Russia who are in Christian tradition uh, definitely will call uh, your teaching as a sect or something like that. Mm -hmm. We are a sect, but so is Orthodox. Everybody is a sect. Everybody is a part of a totality, right? Sect comes from sectum in, in, in Latin and it means part of. Mm -hmm. We are a part of Buddhism. They are a part of Christianity, right? Everybody is a sect. Unless that's one religion that takes everything in, you know, then it's not a sect. Then it's a religion. But does not God a universe? Does it mean that there are different gods or God is one? Buddha is not a god. He just tells us how things happen. And we quite honestly try to avoid gods. We wish them a lot of happiness, but a bit away, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they say so many funny things, you know, and, and they limit people's freedom and stuff like that. So we say, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. We like to we depend on our own inner view, our own inner way of thinking. But religions are very dangerous. If you look back, you know, to maybe 2,000 years, religions have killed more people than even politics. And it's still happening around the world. Middle East now, different kinds of Muslims or Islamists killing each other, you know, or wherever you look, there are lots of people have been killed by, by religions. They can press people from so many different sides, you know, that they have no chance and they begin to behave like less than human. They burn all they burn ladies because they say they're witches, you know, they do all kinds of things, right? Very uh, dangerous religion. It's a not traditional Lama uh, from sources uh, which I read. <laughs> and uh, you allow to criticize uh, even Islam. Why? Even Islam? Yeah. Islam is the worst catastrophe we have in the West. Really? They are totally against We have whole parts of our old beautiful cultural towns that are they full of dirt. 
you know, paper lying around everywhere, women walking around like tents and so on. It's terrible, terrible. You know, you go in there as a free person knowing that women want to look nice and be seen, right? And you see all these tents walk around, you know, and you have all that. It's like, whoa. It's religion is one scene, but the way of uh, how people use it is another scene. No, I but mean, they all say it. You know, if you read the Old Testament or the Koran, you know, kill the Jews, kill the Christians, kill the unbelievers, you know, if you read all this stuff, you know, it's in there. What we have to do is to put reason, you know, on top of that and make certain things criminal. Mm -hmm. Things that go against the life of people, you know, they have, they have the respect for people, you know, the freedom for people to make that illegal. That's the that's role of the, of the, of the government. Mm -hmm. Because um, you won't find it in the religions. This is uh, very not typical to hear because everybody no? tried to be political correct. Yeah, but that, so do you know, I'll tell you what happens when people are politically correct and when they die. They become exceedingly confused because they're used to saying something else than what they think. They're used to going against their own, their own understanding and so on. And they will often try to hide between rocks and, in, uh, and between bushes and if some animals come there and mate, they may go between them and they come out with a beautiful fur coat, you know, and four legs for the next incarnation. It's not politically correct. Uh, when <laughs> I, I'm not saying even about <laughs> that it is not true, <laughs> by uh, religion principle correct, but it's not even politically correct. No, no, I'm, like I'm not politically correct. I try to be an honest man. Mm. When I die, I will see my own mind. I'm not playing any games. No games. I say exactly what I think. Or I say, I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. Like in the country, of the case of Ukrainian politics, I was told before I came in, you know, that but not to say too much, right? And, and I say, I cannot really, except for the little girl there, or Tumochenko, or what her name mm -hmm. is, you know, in jail, which I think is barbaric, right? Except for that, you know, I mean, I don't know enough. Mm -hmm. If I start saying something with big meaning, the Dharma said, then I have no idea where I am and what's going on. And so, but I'd like to see your boxer. <laughs> I'd like to see him in <laughs> doing things. Uh, uh, there are uh, some rumors uh, which I read about you. Uh, stop me, interrupt me when I yeah. will be wrong. No, no, uh, please. You eat meat. I enjoy meat. Really? Yes. But I make animal, I make birth. I don't allow that anything is killed for my sake. Mm -hmm. And I make wishes for the animals that they will go to a better rebirth. That's the best thing I can do. Is it I was, my wife and I were vegetarian for three and a half years. It was perfect. Mm -hmm. But we are in a new town with new people every day, you know. And if they have to think, oh, they eat specially and you can do it, you can't do that. doesn't work. And it was my own teacher who said, you must eat normally everywhere. So I make some wishes for the animal that I'm eating, you know, for a better rebirth, for something good. And that's all I can do. I cannot come and say, listen, you have to make completely new food just because I came. Mm -hmm. And you allow yourself to drink alcohol? <sighs> Very little. Very, Very little, you know. I did, I did for a while. It takes too much time. It simply takes too much time. I wake up in the morning, I have five programs in my head. Right? If I also have you know, a big squeezer on top of my head <laughs> together with programs, you know, I'll probably not be very effective. I've sometimes I've been I've been drinking a bit, you know, but it's it doesn't interest me. Mm -hmm. I'm in a state of bliss all the time. I'm feeling so good all the time. Alcohol is just, you know, something to look at. It's not interesting. And uh, you are still proponent of free love or not? Free love? I don't know what to say. I mean, families are the basis of our of our societies, but that people get to know each other before they start a family, I think is all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and what sort of practice or meditation are you using in here every day? Um, generally, the Buddha is over my head, you know. Mm -hmm. He dances down into my heart center, he sits there and he fills me with a light. And then, mm -hmm. I, and then I go on. <laughs> you as a child of 60s, yeah. uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll, uh, yeah. and so everything. <laughs> everything. Uh, but you move in uh, other direction. How many of your friends stayed with the same uh, passion was the same paradigm. Those who stayed with drugs killed themselves. Mm -hmm. I say they died. It doesn't work. 
People think that drugs can bring happiness. They cannot. Drugs like psychedelics, LSD, mescaline, DMT, and other things, you know, they can... And you know everything of that. Yeah, yeah, right? I know. All of, I wrote a paper at the university about it, you know, oh. called yes, I know. <laughs> I wrote such a stack of papers that we went to the East for three, week, for three years, you know, and when we came back again, somebody had thrown it out. So, so I'd probably never become a doctor, but it's all right. Lama is good enough. But anyway, you know, we have this, you know, there's, there, no drug can give us happiness. The only thing a drug can do is to concentrate the happiness we would have maybe in half a, during half a year in eight hours, you know, of total bliss on LSD, for instance. This is what it could do. But then afterwards, there's something missing. Mm -hmm. You run out, it's like you're burning your money, your grivenas, you're not going down and getting coal or oil, right? Mm -hmm. It's too expensive with drugs. You know, our richness is the good impressions we have in our subconscious, what's happening inside, all the good thoughts, everything, and they're, shh, they're burned so quickly, you know, very blissful, but very quickly burned. And then afterwards, people start getting funny, you know, are not happy, and then they do things in their veins, you know, like cocaine or heroin or things like that, and then they're out. Then it's finished. Then that life is over. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and that was what we saw also. That was also a reason we were so glad to bring Buddhism in, because you get the happiness, but you get it from the inside. Mm -hmm. And you, you, it works. <laughs> uh, how many of your friends uh, from 60s uh, uh, are still alive? Yeah. Nobody. Nobody. Uh, we are out of a group of 50 in Copenhagen, you know, who made music that still played today at geniuses, bright, bright, bright people. Now my wife died in 07, you know, yeah, it was terrible, terrible, yeah. But no, terrible for us, great for her, you know, she... But the younger generation which we have now, it looks like they try to follow <laughs> this tradition. The music changed, but everything else doesn't. Yeah, I know, I know it's, <clears throat> but it's also, you know, in Europe we, we know, we have a place in many European towns, uh, West European towns, which is called Dead Man's Corner. Mm -hmm. And you know the people who are standing around there, they will not be there in three weeks, right? Mm -hmm. They'll be dead, right? And, and the destruction of it all is, is difficult. I think that's not the danger for the young people. The danger for the young people is not enough energy. Too much confusion, too much confusion. Not in the West, not enough sports. Your people still look better than ours do, right? And so on. So how they can change uh, themselves to be normal person, normal I think, human? I think they will. The parents just don't give them any pocket money if they don't f follow their exams, you know, if they don't get the exams and stuff like that. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, just normal healthy pressure, <laughs> like we all get. What we get from life, you know, what we get everywhere. Why in those places, spiritual places like Chinese Tibet, like Nepal, Bhutan, yeah. uh, people are so poor? It's the best question that comes to the head. <laughs> it's probably why, it's probably the other way around, that, you know, because they're poor, they're spiritual. But <laughs> that way, whatever, you know. But anyway, I think. I think that uh, first they are very unaccessible places, very difficult places to get. You know, mm -hmm. it's just difficult. You couldn't build a factory or a big office building there or anything like that. It just wouldn't fit. So it means it's a place where some old knowledge that has been run over by the winds or the big wheels of time mm -hmm. many, many times, right? That this survived, you know, that this was able to survive there. But it's falling, at the way, falling apart very quickly. People have lost a lot of it, I think. They have lost, I think, the people who have very strong Buddhist karma are being reborn in the West today. Really? Yeah, I'm sure about it. So many of my friends come in, you know, and I show them things, and I age old Buddhist knowledge, and they say, yes, of course. Really? I mean, I, I, I think we, there was a massive movement, you know, as Buddhism was destroyed in the East, it, it came to the West. I've got students where I myself want to take off my hat and say, you, you're amazing, right? Really amazing. So we believe that light comes from east to west. Yeah, and economy and everything comes from west to east, right? Mm -hmm. It's good, you know, they get some more democracies and more freedoms and stuff like that because of us. and We get some more depth because of them. I think that's good.
But you're not traveling to China in China, no. Chinese no, Tibet? No, I'm not going there because, uh, well, I was, I was. Oh, I had a fantastic tour, but it was completely illegal in 68. 86. In 86, my wife and I and some friends went all across southern Tibet to all the places mm -hmm. where they'd never seen a white face before. They'd never seen a white man before. Mm -hmm. So we so we were going across in February, we were going across East Tibet, you know, at minus 40 on the back of open trucks. On the back of open trucks. It was cold. My wife and one other woman, you know, they got all the luggage, all the warm things we had, and the men <laughs> froze it through, right? And we had, um, and when we came there, you know, it was, we had to stop, we stopped at the different Chinese control posts, and then, you know, we got off and walked around, you know, mm -hmm. and the truck drove through, you know, and we got on the truck again, you know, and went on. Yeah. And do you not travel now to <coughs> Chinese Tibet? <coughs> I actually, uh, my wife and I stayed four years in the Himalayas from 68 to 72, when all the old teachers, high teachers, were still there, who had survived, you know, who had managed to get out when the Chinese attacked in 51 in eastern Tibet and 59 in central Tibet mm -hmm. and everywhere. They had all come out and my wife could, and I could stay there those years with them and learn from them. And now you are not traveling to China? Uh, there's nothing to go for. China is finished, yeah. finished. Tibet is, they have a few hidden yogis here and there, but it takes so long to meet them and so on. You can really say that the knowledge of Tibetan Buddhism has come to the West now. Mm -hmm. Many people now uh, in Ukraine and uh, around the world speaks about end of uh, civilization, year 2012. Yeah. Uh, uh, is it anything uh, ordinary people should be worried and what does it mean to be prepared for transition? Now in Europe, we talk about Islam. <laughs> That's the end of the world, you know, Western Europe, Islam everywhere, you know, freedom, women dressed up like tents and stuff like that. Terrible story, right? But anyway, you know, no, there's so much collective karma. <clears throat> there are so many feelings, thoughts, ideas, movements in space that you cannot just stop it like that. We will live on far beyond 12. But do we need um, other people speaks about a sort of transition in year 2012, which doesn't mean the end, physical end of civilization, but more about spiritual end of this civilization? Well, again, too much energy, too much, too much push from behind, too many habits, you know, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Even in the worst years of the Second World War, there were <clears throat> often more Americans dying on the streets and on the then at the front, right, on the mm -hmm. back home in the USA. So you know, I mean, there's too much energy, there's too much movement. You know, we are all like, ooh, being pushed by all the things that were done, thought, and said before. Have any practice which can help to work with emotions? I think that there's one light, the one uh, meditation I'd like everybody to use. It's amazing. You. Let the Buddha, athletic, pleasant Buddha, appear in front of you. You take a clear light from his forehead into your forehead, filling your head. This bend with sound like om, which benefits the body. You take a red light into your mouth and throat, you know, which benefits the speech function with the vibration R. And you take a blue light into the center of your chest at the level of the heart, you know, and that is very good for holding and calming mind with the sound hung. So you have these three white, red, and blue Oma Hung from a Buddha, and you, then he dissolves in light, mixes together with you, and then when you come out of that again, you know, you feel good. How long can be this road for happiness? Mm, depends how on what much, we did. How much time it can take? Depends on how many lives, what, what we did in our last lives, how many veils we have to remove, how much we have to clean the mirror before it comes. But, People usually in a couple of years say, feel better. Okay, we probably get the elite, to be honest, right? Mm -hmm. I think they're the ones who come. Uh, but they are really attracted to space, right? The feeling of space is freedom, is no limits, you know, it's mind, you know, bringing forth its fearlessness, its joy, and its active compassion. But this is really interesting, right?
This is what we. This is what we are looking for. Who are these, those people who came uh, on your on meetings with you in Russia and Ukraine? They were mainly young people, intellectual students, but also workers. Everybody came. Why is that? Why is that coming? We're always checking more than three fingers between hairline and eyebrows. Good Buddhists, <laughs> you know. And we take them. <laughs> why is that coming? They're coming because they're looking for something. I mean, impermanence is all around us. We see old people, sick people, hear about dead people every day. We know it happens to us. Mm -hmm. And then we get interested and we can just say, is there something that goes beyond that, something I can ultimately trust, right? And then one sees that you cannot trust the body. It gets old, sick, and die. We cannot trust the thoughts and feelings, you know. The only thing we can ultimately trust is that space which makes everything possible and can be aware of all things, meaning mind. Mm -hmm. We can trust the mirror behind the images. We can trust that which is aware, but not the things we are aware of, which is Disneyland, which comes and goes all the time. Mm -hmm. And if one begins to work with that, you know, one begins to become a Buddhist. Does the teachers ever show uh, your evidence of their extraordinary skills? Oh, all the time. All, all the, the time. time. But like some uh, visible examples, like, I don't know, uh, flying off uh, of a car uh, or, or something like that. I don't think I've, I've seen that. I've mainly seen the changes on the level of, of, of people's perception. Yeah, I can tell of lots of healings where people were very sick, you know, and our Lama helped people. And yeah, but, oh, now I have to go into this another place in the mind, another mm -hmm. What, what was impre well impressed us most was when we actually met the Kamapa. Mm -hmm. That was that was amazing. And once we had some police trouble, and our first Lama before we met the Kamapa, you know, we would we were asking, we were thinking of him and asking him, and then all the papers disappeared. The papers, the police <laughs> lost the papers. They disappeared. They uh, they were very they couldn't say how that happened, and we just said thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And so on. So it was, you know, there were a few, few things like that, you know, which, which really impressed us. Mm -hmm. And of course, all the signs, the physical signs that you get, you know, the joy. The what are your relationship with Dalai Lama now? On the side of saving Tibet and everything, 200%, right? Completely one. On, the, on some other things, you know, well, there are some Tibetan... Uh, politics because Tibet has four schools of, of, let's say, of Tibetan Buddhism. And there's this three old so-called red hat schools, and they're the ones who meditate, you know, and we don't have anything to say in politics. So, so your relationship are not... No, we are very good. We are friends, you know, we are very close friends, but we are different schools. I pull for my school, mm -hmm. right? And he pulls for Tibet politically and, of course, also for his school and his organization and so on. No, no, we love each other when we meet each other. We are great friends, you know. I mean, really, from, from 72, 73 when, he came, 73 when he came to Europe the first time, when my wife and I were there, we had a wonderful time. He, everybody saw a very clear imprint of a hand on the moon, full moon. And, and in November, October, late October, early November, when it never snows in Denmark, the moment he came into our center, blanket of snow everywhere. Very impressive. You mentioned about several schools in Buddhism. Yeah. What are the schools? And well, it depends. depends. There's one school which is very old, you can say. They are from about, they are from about 750, approximately, where a great master of meditation, great tantric master called Guru Rinpoche or Padmasambhava, he entered Tibet. And he became, and there was from up to year 800, you know, everything was doing very well. You know, there was a lot of activity, Buddhist activity, a place called Samya got built and everything else. Then he left one of his main wives, you know, Yeshe Tsokyal. Um, she, 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 he left her when he himself went, it looks like he went to Assam or something like that to, to teach the cannibals there to change their diet or something mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, when he did that, then um, he... And then he left his, his, his wife, and, but she would rather meditate than do politics. Mm -hmm. so, she, so a king called Langdama came in and he destroyed everything. Mm -hmm. It was so-called Blackburn or Black Shamanism, you know, with killing lots of animals and mm -hmm. centering all that fear and so on, you know, for, for certain results and so on. And here these people, uh, and here then 
Well, then up till 1,050, uh, 250 years, there was hardly any Buddhism in Tibet. Mm -hmm. And then Mapa, just at the time when the Islamists and Muslims, when they were destroying, you know, the high culture of, of northern India around with the different Khans and Arab starving coming in from the west and destroying all the old uh, culture and knocking the noses off the Buddha and burning the libraries and burning everything. At that time when this happened, right, and millions were killed, millions. At that time, you know, then um, Mapa, then uh, Mapa came down and got all the different teachings he could get from, from, from India and he stayed about 16 and a half years there, three times. Last time, really old, he, he waddled over the mountains, you know, down to and, and saw the teacher for the last time. I mean, but there is no uh, big contradiction between no, those No, no, there's not. It's just people are different. Some people like to think and speak. Some people like to bliss out in meditation. Right? Mm -hmm. And we are the bliss types. How you recognize uh, your spiritual relatives, if they exist? They interest. When I talk about emptiness, and you're talking about? Emptiness, that nothing is anything in itself, but everything appears from conditions which come together, change and disappear again. When I give that teaching, I see 10% of the eyes, they go, oh, and the others <laughs> didn't hear a word, right? And that's the family. The ones who trust mind itself, beyond, you know, all the ideas it is or it isn't, the ones, the ones who trust the direct experience of what's going on. That's the family. So you have a huge family. I have an enormous family. I've started 630, 40 centers around the world. I'm in around the world twice every year. I have, <laughs> yeah, I have given power to 100,000 people over the years since mm -hmm. 87. I've given that sign and I've done all kinds of other things, you know. I mean, started groups since, yeah. And what does it mean, this center, how it's functioned? What is it's it? just some people come together to meditate. Mm -hmm. The Tibetans have very unique psychological, philosophical knowledge about mind. Mm -hmm. And their message, you know, where you concentrate on certain forms of energy and light, you dissolve, you make a vibration that fits with them mm -hmm. to open up one's own inner system. One dissolves them in rainbow light or just light mixes the this feeling into oneself and one has the experience that the experience of the thing experienced and the act of experiencing are the same mm -hmm. and from there then a lot of intuition and a lot of good things happen. Mm -hmm. It's knowledge, it doesn't exist anywhere else. It survived in Tibet for the last thousand years, right, and now with the Chinese it's almost more or less gone. People who are coming to you on meetings with you to Buddhism, are they coming from a Christian, a Christian side or are they are not believing God at all? I don't think we have many uh, Christians, you know, who come. It's mainly people who have made the step into materialism or the ordinary values and so on. And then they discover, I mean, Buddha's teachings about mind are exceedingly interesting. I mean, really showing us that we, the only thing that stays is awareness. Mm -hmm. And that fits in, and then you get, you know, our scientists in, in CERN, mm -hmm. right, telling us that, you know, if you keep splitting things, in the end there's nothing, meaning materialism is not right. Mm -hmm. And then that if also, if you have, make a complete vacuum, it fills with particles, and nobody knows from where. Mm -hmm. and that means nihilism is not, is not important. It is also no, no solution. So if we can avoid these two things, these two limitations by it is there and it isn't there, then our mind has a lot more freedom to be creative and strong and experiencing and experience things and so on. That is what it's about, letting our basic consciousness, the mirror behind the images, the ocean underneath the waves, you know, the awareness which is seeing things behind all the things we are aware of, to make that conscious. Uh, how explain to people who are not interested in that, what does it mean, energy, influence, spiritual connection, things like yeah. this? They will never know. If they're not interested, <laughs> they'll never know. And if they have had something? If they've had explain? some interest, then I'd say try, go to a lecture and just see what you feel. Uh -huh. Don't have too many ideas about anything, you know, don't have too many expectations, but just see if, it, if the hat fits your head.
And if you think it fits, oh, hmm, I felt good about this. It seems to have meaning. This explains my experience in my childhood. So this and this and this. If you, if you do that, then I say, okay, learn meditation. So you are not agitate them to or not push them to come. No, you are no, simply... no, 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 no. I mean, the most stupid thing one can do is try to convince people. It's like giving them a hat with the wrong size. Either it falls off with their eyes, you know, they have to lift it up all the time. It's too small, it falls off, they have to put it on it all the time. It's the most stupid thing one can do is to try to missionarize. One destroys one's own life, one makes everybody else cramped and unhappy and stuff like that. It's a ridiculous way. The only thing is present your good, like in the supermarket, and some will say, mm, I'll take this, I'll take that, and then they go. So you can't make people happy if they're not ready to be happy? No, because they won't understand what you talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being with it's us It's a joy, today. you know, you, I really, you know, I heard that you have about the last show of quality in mm -hmm. your country, right? Everybody else is making soap operas, so thank you for giving your time. And every time in Ukraine, I love to come to you. It's really my pleasure to yeah. be with you today. Це було Ткаченко Ей. Дякую, що були з нами.